Now on BBC4, Hugh Edwards pays tribute to Britain's first working class Prime Minister, Lloyd George, the people's champion. The River Duivor near Crickieth in North Wales. It's a stretch of water that meant a lot to a man who means a lot to me, David Lloyd George. These days, many people in Britain barely recognize his name. But it was a very different story some 60 years ago. Lloyd George died in March 1945, in the closing months of the Second World War. He was an old man by the time of his death, so it came as no surprise. And yet his funeral was marked by an astonishing expression of grief. People came from all over Britain to pay their last respects to a man who dominated the political scene for much of their lives and whose place in history they believed was assured. Like Winston Churchill, with whom he'd enjoyed a long political partnership, Lloyd George was rightly regarded as one of the greatest prime ministers in British history. On the day of his funeral, the tributes came from every part of the globe. What on earth would the mourners who gathered on that day have made of the fact that by today, their national hero would enjoy a less than impressive reputation? This is the utterly magical spot where over 60 years ago, David Lloyd George was laid to rest under this simple stone on the steep banks of the River Duivor in North Wales. One of the most brilliant statesmen of the 20th century and one of the greatest Welshmen of all time. And yet, if you mention his name today, even in parts of Wales, you risk getting an unpleasant response. Because the Welsh wizard, with the colourful private life, has been reduced in the eyes of many people to the level of a smutty joke. And I have to say to you that I find that a grotesque injustice. David Lloyd George was hardly a saint. Let's make that plain from the start. Yes, he was a womanizer, and yes, he had other failings too. He made some dreadful mistakes during his long career. The biggest of all, perhaps, his inexplicable decision to spend time with Adolf Hitler in the run-up to the Second World War. But errors like this, great as they are, can't detract from just how much he achieved. Most of us were taught at school about Lloyd George's remarkable record as a Prime Minister in wartime. What is less familiar, perhaps, is his unmatched achievement as a social reformer. Here we have the first British politician to go from very humble origins to number 10 Downing Street. He never forgot what it was to be poor and he had a burning desire to improve the lives of working-class people. And over a long and extraordinary career, that is what he did. People talk about Churchill as being a great Prime Minister, and indeed he was, but Lord George had an amazing ministerial and Prime Ministerial record, leaving behind major social change, and that's something that Churchill didn't have. To be able to create something from, from nothing, which is what was happening in the 1906 to 1914 uh, liberal, liberal government, uh, w w was a tremendous success, and it, 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 w it will not surpass by anybody. I think he was an incredibly creative force. Oh, yes, of course, pensions, uh, national insurance, health insurance, which is a tremendous advance, far ahead of what the Americans have done even today. And uh, really, to look at LG in that period, he would be so far to the left of New Labour that he would have been immediately expelled by Blair. Let them realise what they're doing. They are forcing a revolution, and they will get it. He said in one of his diaries that it was a worthy aim to promote yourself by benefiting others. And I think that is what drove him on. He was the people's champion. 
people these days fail to realize is that David Lloyd George was once one of the most famous men alive. When he visited America in 1923, thousands of people turned out to see him. They did so because, like millions of people around the world, they saw him as the chief architect of Britain and America's victory over Germany in the First World War. He was mobbed, not just in New York City, but everywhere he went. Whether he was making a brief stop on the vast prairies of Canada, or appearing in St. Louis as guest of honor at a gathering of Native American chiefs. Yes, he was big abroad, but believe me, he was much, much bigger at home. This small man was a political giant. Lloyd George wasn't just respected in Britain, he was widely loved. That's something you can't fail to pick up when you visit the small museum dedicated to his memory, which stands today in his home village of Llanus Dimdui. As the many drawings confirm, even Britain's cartoonists, then as now a pretty unsentimental bunch, tended to portray him in a warm and sympathetic light. Genuine respect for his achievements across a wide range of fields clearly had a lot to do with this. But the nature of his personality was pretty important too. Ask anyone who met him and they'll confirm straight away that here was a man whose personality was captivating and utterly hypnotic. I met him in 1937 when my dad was re-elected to the House of Commons and uh, it's, it's very vividly fixed in my mind, this short, magnetic man. I mean, talk about charisma, the man absolutely radiated it. Lloyd George could charm a crowd like no other. That's clear from the piece of film you're about to see, which was shot at a gala evening held to celebrate his golden wedding anniversary in 1938. Marriage is um, one of the very few institutions that enable people whose dispositions and temperaments are exactly opposite to each other to live in perfect harmony <laughs> for fully 50 years. And it hardly say, my wife and I have different temperaments. <laughs> One of us contentious. <laughs> combative. <laughs> stormy. That's my wife. <laughs> then there's the other partner. Classy, <laughs> calm, peaceable, and patient. <laughs> That's me. Great warmth and natural wit added enormously to Lloyd George's appeal. They played a big part in making him such a popular figure. But not everyone fell under his spell. Far from it. Lloyd George had a big problem, which was that Britain's political elite had never known anyone like him. They didn't understand him, so they didn't trust him. He was considered a very dangerous demagogue. The fact that he was Welsh made it worse. Somebody put together a whole series of libelous comments on the Welsh called Perfidious Welshman in 1911. And that is, and it sold remarkably well. And the sole motivation of that was to get at Lloyd George, there can be no doubt about it. He was so identified with Wales that he was not part of the metropolitan establishment. And I suppose that um, Toffee knows London rather looked down on this sort of Celtic country bumpkin. A certain degree of anti-Welsh prejudice has always been acceptable and not something to be ashamed of. I mean, you know, Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief, and people would say this perfectly easily. So he had to overcome, and did overcome, a great deal of that sort of social prejudice simply by, A, ability, because he was just simply very clever and very able, but also by being very so likeable and infectious. No one was more dismissive of David Lloyd George during his lifetime than the Cambridge economist John Maynard Keynes. And in a very famous essay in 1920, 
He wrote this about Lloyd George. He said that he was a goat-footed bard, a half-human visitor from the hag-ridden magic and enchanted woods of Celtic antiquity. And for good measure, he said that Lloyd George was rooted in nothing. Well, with respect to Keynes, Lloyd George was very firmly rooted in a particular time and place and culture. Rural North Wales in the second half of the 19th century. The man called the Welsh wizard was actually born on the outskirts of Manchester in 1863, but his parents brought him back to their native Wales when he was just six months old. Not long afterwards, his father, a schoolteacher called William George, died suddenly at the age of 43, leaving his young widow, Elizabeth, with two small children and another on the way. Lacking the money she needed to raise the family as a single mother, Elizabeth had no choice but to move back to the house where she'd grown up, in the tiny village of Llanas Dimdwy. The house was called Highgate, and it still stands today. It's been carefully restored in recent years by the local council, and now looks pretty much the way it did during Lloyd George's childhood. Anyone who's interested in Lloyd George would be well advised to come here. Seeing the very modest surroundings in which he grew up gives you a strong sense of who he was and what his early life must have been like. Lloyd George, the great statesman, once proudly described himself as a cottage-bred man. And he wasn't joking. Back in those days, prime ministers of Great Britain were not expected to emerge from little places like this. Just two bedrooms, this is the bigger of the two, and if you can believe it, there were five people sleeping here, as we understand it. Lloyd George, and his brother and sister, and their mother, and then her mother too. No loo, that's at the bottom of the garden, what we call in Welsh a tea bach, or a little house, and the other bedroom is through here. Take a look at it, it's much smaller than the other one, and this was the room of Richard Lloyd, David's uncle the man who had more influence on Lloyd George than anyone else. Richard Lloyd, Uncle Lloyd, as David and his siblings called him, was a trained shoemaker and the family's only breadwinner. But that's not all he was by any means. He was a man of considerable learning, Richard Lloyd. Although he'd spent his life making shoes, he read considerably, he had a very nimble mind, he was very politically involved uh, and very theologically involved. So it was, in a sense, an ideal upbringing. What Richard Lloyd tried to do, and did very successfully, was pass on to young David the values that governed his own life, seriousness, diligence, and a thirst for knowledge. Thanks to his uncle's example and the extensive library left to him by his dead father, David Lloyd George, as he now started calling himself in his uncle's honour, developed into a mature and thoughtful child with firm political views. Well, I think right from the beginning, he cared passionately about social justice. I mean, he grew up in a North Wales where there were very clear class distinctions and also, I think, quite clear ethnic distinctions. There was an Anglo-Welsh upper class, and they owned a great deal of the land in those days, and I think Lord George was very conscious of that, as, as many Welsh people were. The divisions that ran right through Wales during Lloyd George's childhood were very deep indeed, and they were just as evident in Llanis Dimdwy as they were elsewhere. Most of the people who lived in the village were relatively poor, but a small minority the landed gentry of the area were prosperous individuals who differed from the ordinary villagers in many important ways. For a start, they spoke English instead of Welsh. They were also Anglicans, members of the Church of England, who trooped along every Sunday to Llanis Dimdwy's parish church, whereas the other villagers were all chapel-goers, or non-conformists, as we should really call them. The nonconformist majority felt, with some justification, that they were oppressed by the Anglican elite. <laughs> 
and the social tension this created in the village had a big effect on Lloyd George. We know this because of a key episode in his early life. It took place at Llanus Dimdui's tiny village school, when Lloyd George was a pupil here, around the year 1873. He was just 10 years old at the time, but the incident proves he had a much greater sense of social justice than we'd normally expect of a child. Just like today, most of the children who attended the school back then were Welsh speakers. Unlike today, for the most part, they were devout non-conformists too. And yet, because the school was run by the Church of England, lessons were conducted in English, and the Anglican faith was the order of the day. The situation was hardly acceptable, and Lloyd George became determined to do something. What he did was dramatised later on in a fascinating silent movie, which is held today at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. I've always wanted to see the film, so this is my chance. The film was made in 1918, when Lloyd George was at the height of his fame and power, but it was never released at the time. We don't know precisely why, but Lloyd George might have been reluctant to appear too power-crazy and big-headed. The film was lost for many years and then found quite recently. It's been carefully restored by library staff. The film is undoubtedly well made, though it seems a little quaint today, but it does shed some fascinating light on Lloyd George's early life especially that day at Llana Stimdui School, when he made a stand. Once a year, Lloyd George and his fellow pupils had to put on a particular display of loyalty. They all had to recite the Anglican Catechism to a distinguished deputation, which included a local vicar and the local squire. I think it's fair to say that Lloyd George despised this little ritual, and he was determined to disrupt it, which is what he did. On the day of the visit, Lloyd George took matters into his own hands and staged a bit of a revolt. The squire and the vicar, of course, were appalled, but the teacher seems to have realised that his young pupil might have had a point. We'd have to say that taking a stand like this at the age of 10 required a certain amount of courage. And this was just a sign of things to come. He did have, from a very early age, this extraordinary sense of his own abilities and ambition and the confidence that he would succeed and get right to the top. He was never held back by any sense that he, he was storming citadels or having to fight prejudice. He knew he was bloody good and he was going to get to the top and he didn't see any obstacles that would stop him. Determined to be a Liberal Member of Parliament, Lloyd George perfected his rhetorical skills in his early teens, making fiery speeches at the village blacksmith shop, which doubled up as the local debating society. And then, after leaving school at the age of 14, he managed to get himself a job as an article clerk at a solicitor's office. He studied hard to become a qualified lawyer, and in 1883, still aged only 20, he opened a legal practice of his own in Port Maddox. Surprisingly enough, the firm he started over 120 years ago, with his younger brother William as his junior partner, still exists and is still in the same premises. The caseload for the staff today consists for the most part of pretty mundane stuff. The same was true, no doubt, when Lloyd George himself worked here. But one case that came across his desk helped to make him a well-known figure throughout Wales. The case revolved around the very thing that had motivated his classroom revolt several years before. The oppressive dominance, as most people in Wales saw it, of the Anglican Church. <laughs> 
and it's centred on the place I'm heading for now, the tiny hamlet of Llanfrothen, which lies on the edge of Snowdonia. The dispute was all about burial rights, more particularly the rights of non-conformist people to be buried in Anglican churchyards. There was an old slate worker who wanted to be buried alongside his late daughter here at St. Brothen's Church. In theory, he was perfectly entitled to that wish. But when the family got here, the hardline vicar had locked the gate. He didn't want any non-conformists in his graveyard. Well, the family didn't know what to do, but they knew a man who did. That man, of course, was David Lloyd George. He was outraged by the injustice and the illegality of what had happened. And no doubt spotting an opportunity, maybe, to advance his career, he advised the family to break the padlock and bury the old man. They did as he suggested, and a famous court case ensued. Thanks to what everyone who witnessed it said was a stunning performance by Lloyd George, the jury found in the family's favour. But that wasn't the end of the matter. The judge who presided over the trial was, guess what, an Anglican. And when the jury sided with the family, he couldn't believe it. So he overturned the verdict. That's justice for you. Anyway, Lloyd George took the case to the Court of Appeal. He won, the family was triumphant, and David Lloyd George was on his way. Within a couple of years of the San Brothen burial case, Lloyd George had achieved his goal. He'd become a member of Parliament. He'd been adopted as the Liberal candidate for the constituency of Carnarvon Boroughs. And in April 1890, a snap by-election led to him winning the seat by a narrow margin of 18 votes. The high-pressure world he now entered would remain his preferred environment for the rest of his life. And his impact on it is hard to overstate. When he'd visited the House of Commons as a boy, he'd referred to it in his diary as the region of my future domain. And that's exactly what it became. He was an immense presence here for half a century, which is why his statue stands opposite Churchill's at the entrance to the debating chamber itself. It is, of course, a fitting tribute. But it's important to point out that great eminence didn't come Lloyd George's way overnight. In fact, he spent his first 15 years in the House as a not particularly well-regarded backbench MP. Why on earth did Lloyd George have to wait so long languishing on the backbenches, probably spending quite a bit of his time out here on the terrace of the House of Commons, enjoying the odd drink or two with some colleagues? Well, the party grandees thought that he was a bit of an upstart, a troublemaker. He'd been involved, for example, in the campaign for home rule in Wales, which hadn't exactly endeared him to some. And then there was a financial scandal involving the purchase of shares in a gold mine in Patagonia, the first of three sleazy financial episodes in his career. And then to top it all, there was the question of his private life, because Lloyd George, this fine product of uh, non-conformist Wales, wasn't exactly the model of a loyal husband, and that's putting it mildly. And what is interesting about Lloyd George and his son Richard, in a rather spiteful book he wrote about his father, points out that he had virtually no hobbies, except philandering, he says. He played a little golf, but apart from that, his other hobby was pursuing women. If you read some of the accounts, you wonder how Lloyd George ever had any time to be an active politician. He was primarily a very professional politician, but yes, he did like women. He was attracted to uh, pretty women, and uh, he certainly had strong relationships with the wives of at least three Liberal MPs. Lloyd George was obviously the person mainly to blame for the numerous infidelities which littered his long marriage to Margaret. But it's fair to say that she too bore some of the blame. She was Margaret Owen until her wedding to Lloyd George in 1888. Dame Margaret, as she later became, bore her husband five children, and her devotion to him was never in doubt. The problem was that she was equally devoted to North Wales, where she'd been brought up 
and she flatly refused because of this to live with Lloyd George in London when he became an MP. Her absence provided the great Welshman with motive and opportunity for many affairs. And in his eyes, at least, it provided some justification too. Lloyd George wrote pathetic letters to his wife when he was a young MP in the 1890s, saying, I wish you'd come down here, I'd come back every evening to a dark flat with no one to cook me a meal and no one to darn my socks. I mean, he, he, he was always felt that his wife neglected him in a way that a wife was not in those days expected to do. A wife should have been you know, at her husband's side. And if she wasn't, she couldn't be entirely su surprised if he strayed. And I don't think Margaret Lloyd George was all that surprised. And as long as it didn't get into the divorce court, so long as there wasn't a scandal, I think she was content with that. Lloyd George's apparent inability to keep his hands off other women wasn't the only thing Margaret had to put up with. She also had to suffer the way in which, throughout their marriage, he put career ahead of everything else. Now, it has to be said, she had been warned, and this is the proof. Because here at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, in the Lloyd George archive, we have a very telling letter written to Margaret Owen in 1885, and that is three years before they were married. And Lloyd George says this, My supreme idea is to get on. To this idea, I shall sacrifice everything except, I trust, honesty. I am prepared to thrust even love itself under the wheels of my juggernaut if it obstructs the way. Well, there's no sacrificing honesty there, is there? The Lloyd George juggernaut was rolling very soon at the outbreak of the Boer War in 1899. He opposed the war from the start and shot to fame as a result. The effect on his public profile would be overwhelmingly positive in the end, but to begin with, it was quite the opposite. His brave and principled anti-war stand made him a hate figure to those who saw support for the war as every Briton's patriotic duty. The full extent of the bad feeling he'd aroused became clear in December 1901, when he tried to deliver an anti-war speech at Birmingham Town Hall. He provoked a vicious riot, which raged for several hours. This lively restaging of the event from the silent movie on Lloyd George's life underplays the true ferocity of what happened. Around 30,000 people took part in the riot, some backing Lloyd George, the vast majority against. Two people, a policeman and a rioter, lost their lives, and Lloyd George only got away with it when he was smuggled out of the building disguised as a police inspector. Well, that was a pretty narrow escape for Lloyd George, let's face it, one of many in his life. But as public opinion turned against the war, his stature grew enormously and very soon he would reap the benefits because in 1905 the Liberals were back in government and this man, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, was the new Prime Minister. He had no choice but to give Lloyd George a place on the front bench. After 15 frustrating years as a backbencher, the Welsh wizard had finally arrived. He was a cabinet minister, president of the Board of Trade, it wouldn't be long before he'd made his mark. It's difficult to overstate, really, the case for Lloyd George's achievements as a minister in the new Liberal government of 1905. One often forgets that once one's a minister, uh, politics is really about how you work with the civil service. And Lloyd George proved himself to be so deft at that using the brain power, as it were, of the civil service to, to, to deliver social reform. He brought the uh, Port of London into public ownership, and then, of course, he uh, introduced the Merchant Shipping Act, which got rid of some of the abuses of the merchant ship owners of uh, the old coffin ships. And uh, really, to look at LG in that period, uh, he would be so far to the left of New Labour that he would have been immediately expelled by Blair. In 1907, still at the Board of Trade, Lloyd George used his ability to get on with trade unionists and railway bosses to head off a threatened rail strike. 
The skills he showed deeply impressed the general public and parliamentary colleagues, and the episode greatly enhanced his reputation as the true star of Campbell Bannerman's Liberal government. It was a moment of triumph for him, but any happiness he may have felt wasn't destined to last. November, his eldest daughter, Meyer, a healthy girl up until this point, was suddenly taken ill. Her condition quickly worsened, and within a few days, she was dead. Meyer Elinid was, quite simply, her father's favourite, and she was just 17 when she died in 1907 of a burst appendix. Lloyd George was devastated and the family paid for this lovely stained glass window to be installed at the Welsh Chapel here in Clapham in South London. Lloyd George never entirely got over this loss. But 1908 brought a series of dramatic developments which must at least have eased the pain. That April, there was a change of occupant at number 10 Downing Street. Campbell Bannerman was seriously ill, he was forced to resign, and he was replaced as Prime Minister by Herbert Asquith, the Chancellor. And his first job was to find a new occupant for the house that he had just vacated. Number 11 Downing Street, official residence of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And who did he choose? Well, David Lloyd George, despite the fact that the men had a bit of a tricky and volatile relationship but he recognised Lloyd George's brilliance. And what followed was the most daring and successful chancellorship of modern times. Lloyd George was to stay at number 11 for a period of eight years. Morning. Good morning. I've come to see the chancellor. Come in. Thank you very much. Only two chancellors have held the job for a greater length of time. William Gladstone back in the 19th century and the man who's lived here at number 11 since 1997, Gordon Brown. I knew that he had a very high regard for his liberal predecessor, so I arranged to meet for a brief chat. Good. We'll just come in here and just have a look. Uh, that's the Lloyd George uh, portrait. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, uh, it's a great portrait. You see all the papers around, and it's obviously after he was prime. Done in the 20s, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. But, but very impressive. Why are you an admirer of Lloyd George? Because he was a dynamic force. I think someone who... Uh, uh, took risks, uh, was incredibly powerful in pushing things forward, uh, worked uh, on, on the basis if you have a good idea, you really push it, push it, push it forward. Uh, someone said he took a leap in the dark and then took another leap, and that's really how I think he saw politics. A lot of risks. When I went into the Treasury, Lloyd George had published a, a document, We Can Conquer Unemployment. Uh, and on the document, the Treasury Permanent Secretary of the day had written, at the time it was published, I think 1929, had written three words, inflation, extravagance, bankruptcy. And they rejected Lloyd George's proposals, but everybody knows Keynesian economics that followed, uh, that these were the right proposals. I think he was an incredibly creative force, and to be able to create something from nothing, which is what was happening in the 1906 to 1914 Liberal government, was a tremendous success, and it, it, it will not be surpassed by anybody. Thank you, Roland. <laughs> what Lloyd George did as Chancellor was to launch an all-out attack on the social injustice that had offended him since he was a boy. He was determined to improve the lives of Britain's most impoverished people, and he started with one group whose neglect couldn't be denied, the elderly. <laughs> Unlike some other countries in Europe, Britain at that time had no system of old age pensions. Lloyd George now put that right. The five shillings a week pension for the over 70s sounds pitiful for us today, but it made a difference. I do recall talking to a very old man who remembers his grandfather receiving the money and going on and on, and, and he said to his grandfather, you talk about as if Lloyd George uh, was Jesus Christ and is going to send you to heaven. And the answer was, well, perhaps he won't do that, but he's making the waiting room much more comfortable. The idea of five shillings a week, when otherwise it would have been starvation. It was an enormous breakthrough. So the revolution had started, 
The Old Age Pensions Act was the most radical measure seen in Britain for many, many years. But Lloyd George wasn't going to stop with pensions. He wanted to help the sick and the unemployed. How on earth was the Chancellor going to pay for all that? Well, he could raise import duties. Trouble is, that would hit the very people he was trying to help, namely the poor. So there was only one answer. Direct taxes would have to go up. Way up. And that was a crucial decision, a turning point for Lloyd George and for the entire country. And the stage was set for one of the greatest political confrontations in British history, the battle over the people's budget of 1909. The budget speech absorbed Lloyd George's energy for several days. Unlike practically any other speech he gave in his life, he wrote it down carefully and read it out later word for word. Possibly as a result, it wasn't his most inspiring performance. But the importance and the impact of the speech were immense. In this country, we have already made provision for the aged over 70. All we now have to do to keep ourselves on a level with Germany is to make some further provision for the sick, for the invalided, for widows, and orphans. <laughs> to say that the speech was radical doesn't begin to tell the story. Income tax went up significantly, death duties went up, there were two entirely new sources of revenue, taxing the ownership of land, and a super tax on the very rich. And all of this was delivered in a pretty dry, matter-of-fact kind of way, until near the end of the speech, when the Chancellor suddenly switched and made a powerful moral case. This is a war budget. It is to wage implacable warfare on poverty and squalidness. I cannot help hoping and believing that before this generation has passed away, we shall have advanced a great step towards that good time when poverty and the wretchedness and human degradation that always follow in its camp will be as remote to the people of this country as the wolves which once infested its forests. I commend this budget to the House. Most members of the House of Commons, including some Tories, reacted favourably to Lloyd George's plans but they got a very different reaction elsewhere, especially in what they call the other place. Just imagine the anger, the sheer resentment, and the sense of panic, quite frankly, which spread along these red leather benches in the magnificent House of Lords when the members realized what the people's budget was all about. Britain's richest landowners, the hereditary peers, were about to be landed with the biggest tax bill of all time. And guess what? They weren't very happy about it. But they did have the constitutional power to stop Lloyd George in his tracks. The question was, would they dare? Their lordships knew that rejecting the budget would trigger the biggest constitutional crisis Britain had seen since the Glorious Revolution of 1688. As they tried to summon up the courage to take this enormous step, Lloyd George turned up the heat by making two of the boldest speeches of his entire career. The first was delivered at Limehouse in London's East End in July 1909. Provision for the aged and the deserving poor. Is it not time that something was done? There are many in this country blessed by providence with great wealth. And if there are amongst them men who grudge out of their riches a fair contribution towards the less fortunate of their fellow countrymen, they are very shabby rich men. The speech caused uproar in the press, but uncompromising as it was, 
it was little more than a curtain raiser for the even more provocative attack which Lloyd George unleashed a few months later in Newcastle. Let them realize what they're doing. They are forcing a revolution and they will get it. <laughs> The Lords may decree a revolution, but it is the people who will direct it. If they begin, issues will be raised that they little dream of. The question will be asked whether 500 men, ordinary men, chosen accidentally from amongst the unemployed, <laughs> should override the judgment, the deliberate judgment, of millions of people who are engaged in the industry that makes the wealth of the country. Did all this constitute a class war? Some people thought it did, not least King Edward VII. Oh, the king thought that he, he was a wild man. He, he compared him to the Jacobins during the French Revolution, and uh, he, he felt that uh, he even doubted Lloyd George's sanity at one time. And Lloyd George didn't mind. I mean, he had no particular regard for the king or for monarchs in general. He wanted to win. He wanted to get his budget through. He wanted, above all, to have a platform for, for social reform. The view from the throne was bang on. This was class war. And Lloyd George, the people's champion, was determined to win. He had no time for the aristocracy at all. He wanted to confront them, and he wanted to make them pay more tax. And everyone in this House of Lords knew that he wasn't bluffing. So they braced themselves, and they rejected his budget. And for the first time in 200 years, Parliament was in crisis. The battle dragged on for months. No one knew who was going to win, Commons or Lords. And to try to end the crisis, Herbert Asquith called a snap election. That's when things finally started to move. <laughs> Members of the House of Lords decided very wisely that they'd push things to the limit so they withdrew the veto and at last the people's budget passed into law which was good news for Lloyd George and even better news for the working class who'd benefit from all the extra money but Lloyd George's battle with the House of Lords wasn't over he wanted bigger change and they were standing in the way what he needed was a truly radical solution the death of King Edward VII in May 1910 would change everything for Lloyd George and for Asquith. Edward had been a staunch defender of the status quo. His successor and son, George V, was known to be more flexible. The two politicians put to him a simple plan for bringing the Lords into line, and he agreed to put it into effect. The new king made it very clear. Unless the House of Lords agreed to limit their own powers, he would create dozens of new peers who would force the measure through in any case. Well, faced with that kind of pressure, the Lords just caved in. And the Parliament Act of 1911 came into force. It's still being used to this day. Never again would the upper house be able to overpower the elected chamber. <laughs> Free at last from aristocratic opposition, Lloyd George now had the chance he needed to make life better for millions of people in Britain who were either sick or unemployed. Working with his friend Winston Churchill, a left-leaning liberal at that time, he drew up the blueprint for one of the most important pieces of legislation ever seen in Britain, the National Insurance Act of 1911 crucially important act and which still survives in its broad principle and it created a comprehensive system of health insurance and it also had a limited area of national unemployment insurance and that was very much Lloyd George's work and it probably 
was his most important contribution to British social policy. What particularly impresses some historians today is the cunning way in which Lloyd George funded the scheme, avoiding the cruder methods that politicians of other parties would probably have relied on. Conservatives would have gone for protection, that was the policy that they were offering, and that would have meant the poor would have paid more on their food. With the uh, Labour Party, it would have been direct taxation. Lloyd George only takes pensions out of direct taxation. Everything else is insurance, i.e. everybody pays in, the employer, the worker, and the state. Now that is a middle way, to quote a certain Tony Blair. Knowing little and no doubt caring even less about the details of the scheme, the public responded very warmly. But not everyone was on side. One must bear in mind that a large section of the working class had already insured themselves through people like the Pearl and the Prudential and through friendly societies. And the great enemy of, the, of Lloyd George in 1911 was the man from the Prue who went to half the houses and said, don't vote for that fella, because, of course, if there was state insurance, they might stop paying the proof. And, of course, the other attack came from ladies, grand Tory ladies, who were expected to stick stamps in little booklets for their servants at the behest of Lloyd George. The thing was a total horror for them. And, indeed, there uh, were occasions in the Albert Hall when the orchestra might play up, uh, say, the men of Harlech, where the entire aristocratic audience would hiss because it was their way of saying they didn't like Lloyd George. Well, despite the Toff's distaste, the National Insurance Act is widely seen today as Lloyd George's greatest achievement. Taken in conjunction with his introduction of old age pensions, it marks him out as one of the key innovators in British political history. The idea is that Lloyd George and his radical colleagues in that very important progressive Edwardian liberal government that they set out to do and actually achieved did set much of the agenda for British political parties for the next 50 or 60 years. The experiments, as Lord George would himself would have recognised them, of health and unemployment insurance, of old age pensions, reached their culmination in the arrival of the welfare state uh, in 1945 and afterwards. It was a huge shift from the Victorian way of thinking, which was all about self-help, to uh, the 20th century way of looking at social problems and saying that, well, there are people out there who are suffering through no fault of their own. Surely the state ought to use its in income to create some kind of safety net for these people. And Lloyd George is absolutely crucial in that great political intellectual shift. By 1912, Lloyd George had secured a place in history as one of the prime architects of a more civilized society. The sad thing is that what followed would harm his image and greatly damage his radical credentials. Lloyd George couldn't resist a nice little earner. And as we know, the city of London, even today, is full of so-called nice little earners. Point is, if you're Chancellor of the Exchequer, it's probably not a good idea to start trading in shares. And yet, back in 1912, in a moment of insanity, that's what Lloyd George actually did. He bought shares in the American company Marconi, knowing full well that its British subsidiary was about to be awarded big government contracts and that the share price would go up through the roof. These days, of course, what we call insider dealing gives you a sentence in prison. Back then, Lloyd George was just very concerned that his career was hanging by a thread. Lloyd George was careful to explain that he hadn't really made any money out of it. He'd made a loss, in fact. And, of course, they were not the same company. But, you know, if you think of how the press would take such an issue up today, the same name, the same man, managing director of one and chairman of the other, well, you know, it's much of a muchness, they all say. He was certainly mauled by that. A parliamentary inquiry was set up to see whether or not Lloyd George had committed an offence. 
dominated by liberals, it let him off the hook. But the great man's troubles weren't over yet. Strikes had started to proliferate by now as organized labor flexed its muscles for the first time. Lloyd George did his best to deal with them, but he enjoyed much less success than he had in the past. Meanwhile, those agitating to gain women the right to vote, the famous suffragettes and their supporters, were bringing more pressure to bear on his life. He approved of their cause, but didn't want women to get the vote until working class men had got it too. Angered by this, the suffragettes gave him no peace, as the feature film made about his life later showed. Some extremists even went so far as to threaten his life with a bomb, which failed to explode. Lloyd George felt worn down by all of this, so he decided to revitalize his reputation as a radical politician. And he set his sights once again on the big landowners, the very people he despised ever since his childhood here in North Wales. Well, that didn't work. And then a second tax-raising budget got bogged down in Parliament just as the people's budget had done. No wonder that Lloyd George, in the words of a close colleague of his, felt overworked and jumpy and irritable and unhappy. Luckily for him, consolation was close at hand. Two years earlier, his wife had arranged for their younger daughter, Megan, to be tutored by a young woman called Frances Stevenson, a former school friend of their late daughter, Meyer. Francis was 25 years younger than Lloyd George, but they were both intensely attracted to each other. In 1913, their relationship blossomed in a predictable way. Megan was then sent to the school in Wimbledon at which Francis was teaching, which gave Lloyd George an excuse to go down to see his daughter, but also to see Francis, so he would then take um, Megan out to tea, but then take Francis out to dinner, probably. And it sort of went from there. She became his mistress, and he proposed this extraordinary long-term relationship, which, as a young woman, she was happy to accept that she would live with him, but not, in fact, be his uh, wife. Lloyd George, of course, had already been married for more than a quarter of a century. His devotion to Margaret was real. But Francis Stevenson offered him something that his wife could never provide. He was always a well-speaking man rooted in Wales, but he was also a man who, in practical terms, moved nationally and internationally, and he wanted somebody with him who felt at ease in this world, could act as a hostess, who understood it, uh, with whom he could communicate on a more equal basis, apart from their sexual relationship. For the next 28 years, right up until Margaret's death in 1941, Lloyd George would have two households, and in effect, two wives. It was an odd arrangement, but it seemed to work. Margaret knew all about Francis and put up with her because it was better than the endless affairs. Francis, likewise, had no wish to rock the boat. And the result was that the truth about Lloyd George's private life didn't become public until well after his death. Lloyd George's affair with Francis Stevenson was still in its early days when dramatic events in the wider world suddenly changed everything for Lloyd George himself and for the world. The outbreak of war in August 1914 caught him off guard as it did almost everyone else. He'd been a vocal opponent of war in the past, but the decision of Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany to invade Belgium a small country, roughly the size of Wales, offended his sense of justice and aroused his patriotic zeal. I remember talking to his daughter on this very thing, and she remembers being in 11 Downing Street and Lloyd George coming in and said, now they've invaded Belgium. My doubts are over. This means war. <laughs> Once he decided that this was a war that he was going to support, he threw himself into it with such extraordinary energy, uh, right from the start. Uh, I mean, wherever you look, 
you see Lloyd George's fingerprints. It's as if he's cranking this machine all on his own, taking on the generals, taking on the, the munitions workers, running along here and there and everywhere. Oh, in many ways, he was the man who won the war. Uh, not so much perhaps as prime minister, but as minister for munitions. He threw himself into uh, running the munitions industry. It was a completely new post. There had been a great shortage of ammunition and equipment. Lloyd George dealt with both. In 1916, after serving as minister of munitions for just over a year, Lloyd George became secretary of state for war. This was the move which lifted his popularity to unprecedented heights. Just how popular he'd become was shown that August, when he visited the Welsh nationalised death board in Aberystwyth and was almost mobbed as he tried to get out of his car. Now, a politician with this level of public appeal was an obvious candidate for Prime Minister. And four months later, when Asquith's premiership ran into the ground, that's what happened. Lloyd George entered number 10 Downing Street for the first time as Prime Minister on the 7th of December 1916. There had been intense speculation about who would emerge and even today historians disagree on the reasons why Lloyd George was finally chosen. But there is more agreement on one thing, which is that Lloyd George didn't get to Downing Street by plotting with other people to stab Asquith in the back. <laughs> The idea that he'd been at the centre of some plot to undermine Asquith plagued Lloyd George for many years. But the truth is that Asquith had lost the confidence of Parliament and he had to go. It was a blow for him, but it was a shot in the arm for Britain, because Lloyd George's arrival at number 10 was, as everyone agrees, a turning point in the war. I mean, it's very important, I think, in wartime, and I think it happened with Churchill as well, and it happened with Georges Clemenceau in France, that you need someone who can in some way inspire the nation and speak for them. And I think Lloyd George did that. He brought a mood of confidence, he brought hope that, yes, perhaps Britain would not just survive the war, but would win it. He showed himself to be enormously more inspirational and uh, energetic than Asquith had been. He was, I think, as important to the winning of the war as Churchill was in the Second World War, uh, even though Lloyd George hadn't Churchill's experience of military matters. I think probably his finest moment in the First World War was the days after the 21st of March 1918, when the Germans broke through, and it really looked, did look very grim. And people who later did not like Lloyd George, who were close to him at that time, said he was very courageous, that he kept going, he wasn't downhearted, and that this kind of radiated out. More popular by 1918 than ever before, despite the continuing trauma of war, Lloyd George was keen to continue his transformation of British society. His aim, encapsulated by him in a long-remembered phrase, was to create a fit country for heroes to live in. And that November, events seemed to leave him perfectly poised to do just that. At precisely 11 o'clock on the morning of November the 11th, 1918, the First World War came to an end after four and a half years of horrific slaughter. Earlier that morning, Lloyd George had come to the House of Commons to tell Parliament that the armistice was about to be signed. And across Europe that day, if you'd asked people who'd done most to bring the war to an end, there's no doubt what the answer would have been. David Lloyd George. In the long run, the First World War would come to be seen, not least by Lloyd George, as a brutal and, to some extent, unnecessary conflict. His close association with it would lessen his stature. But in 1918, it appeared to make him little short of invincible. He can be Prime Minister for life if he likes, said one of his many rivals at the time. But Lloyd George's position was in reality much weaker than it seemed. Lloyd George was at the height of his powers, 
honored everywhere, immensely popular, and yet he had one fundamental political problem. His Liberal Party had been split for the past two years. The man he'd replaced as Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, had moved off into opposition with his Liberal supporters. And facing them, on the other side of the House, was Lloyd George's wartime coalition, which consisted of his Liberal supporters, most Conservative MPs, and a handful of Labour ones too. So at the end of the war in 1918, Lloyd George faced the biggest tactical decision of his career. Would he try to reunite the Liberal Party, or would he soldier on with the coalition? Well, the decision he made to keep things just as they were would prove disastrous for his party, and in the long term, for him. Unsurprisingly, in view of his immense popularity, Lloyd George won the election that followed with ease. But the government that he now headed derived most of its support from Tory MPs. And this made his real position very weak, as he realised from the start. He was very shocked by the size of the majority he won and realised instantly that this put him in the hands of the Tory majority and he was, he was going to be a prisoner of the Tory party. There are things that he may wish to do that he can no longer do because of the need to sustain the support of his Conservative colleagues in government, but also this considerable number of Conservative members of Parliament. He knew that they were not entirely comfortable with him. He knew that they didn't like a lot of what he stood for. And so he was in a very odd position. I mean, here he was, depending on the votes of, of, of people, many cases um, who he would have taxed very heavily as soon as he got the chance. already by being the radical liberal leader of a conservative dominated government Lloyd George was limited even further by the heavy demands made upon him in the field of foreign affairs in January 1919 he was among a host of politicians from dozens of countries who traveled to Paris to take part in the big post-war peace conference held at the Palace of Versailles along with Vittorio Orlando, the Prime Minister of Italy, Georges Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States. He was a member of the Big Four, the group of statesmen who dominated the conference. These men and hundreds of others crammed inside Versailles' Hall of Mirrors were faced with an almost impossible task. How heavily should Germany be punished for causing the war? And what would be the future shape of Europe? Their efforts were bitterly attacked, some time after the conference ended, by Lloyd George's perennial critic, the Cambridge-based economist John Maynard Keynes. But many historians now feel that the peacemakers in general, and Lloyd George in particular, did a rather good job. I'm not saying that the peace settlement in Europe was perfect, I'm not saying that the German treaty was perfect, but I think it was a good deal less imperfect than people like John Maynard Keynes, the great economist, for example, said. What Lloyd George did, and I think this was important, was try and bring the different players together, the French and the Americans, and to a lesser extent the Italians, and get them to compromise. And I think he did play an important part here, I and mean, he kept negotiations going. If Lloyd George had intractable problems to try to solve at Versailles, the problems he faced in Ireland were equally tough. In the wake of the Easter Rising of 1916, Republican leaders like Eamon de Valera had managed to bring that country to the edge of civil war. Lloyd George had responded by sending in the hated Black and Tans, thuggish armed troops openly hostile to the Catholic community, who'd managed to make a bad situation much worse. Appalled by the bloodshed these troops had caused, and aware that he was partly to blame, the Welsh statesman set about trying to put things right by holding a series of meetings in London with De Valera and other Republican leaders. These led eventually to the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1922, under which the Protestant north of Ireland was partitioned from the Catholic south. At the time, the Irish Treaty was seen as a great triumph for Lloyd George and then rapidly reassessed as an even greater disaster. And the same thing happened with the Treaty of Versailles. Even today, the merits of both treaties are still hotly contested. 
The trouble is that debate has made us forget Lloyd George's very real achievements as a social reformer in those years after the First World War. The domestic achievements of Lloyd George's premiership are in fact much greater than is generally realized. For instance, there's the Representation of the People Act, a hugely important piece of legislation which gave millions of working-class men and some women the right to vote, taking Britain a big step closer to becoming a proper democracy. A big improvement in housing conditions was another feather in Lloyd George's cap. He oversaw the creation of thousands of new homes, partially honouring his pledge to create homes fit for heroes across the UK. The education system blossomed under him too. He raised the school leaving age, built more schools and increased teachers' pay. Most important of all, perhaps, was his founding of the Department of Health, a hugely significant step which paved the way for the National Health Service and which reinforces Lloyd George's claim to be the true creator of the welfare state. So why have these real achievements been obscured? Well, we can blame Ireland, and we can blame Versailles, but there was another crisis which came along and which seriously damaged Lloyd George's reputation. Towards the end of 1919, the Sankey Commission, an officially appointed committee of inquiry into the future of the coal industry, recommended that it should be taken into public ownership. Lloyd George was expected to accept the decision but he associated nationalization with communism, and this now led him to make a big mistake. Rather than implementing the report, as he really should have done, he used the fact that the Commission's ruling hadn't been unanimous as an excuse to reject it. This was a move that made him many enemies, not least in his native Wales. Among coal miners in particular, a legacy of bitterness was created which lasted right up until recent times. Someone who knows a lot about all of this is the former Labour leader Neil Kinnock, now Lord Kinnock. I wanted to talk to him about the Sankey affair, and he agreed to meet me in a very appropriate spot, a hillside overlooking Tower Colliery, the last proper coal mine in South Wales. To what extent do you think Lloyd George's rejection of the Sankey report damaged him in areas just like this? It was a monumental mistake, and the damage that it did to Lloyd George here was terminal. What you had in the perception of many former supporters was the political angel of mercy of the welfare state turning himself into the betraying devil incarnate. There had been uh, getting on for a hundred years of the coal industry uh, across the various coal fields of the United Kingdom and for much of that time the coal barons had been ruthless and deeply exploitative. They had underinvested, they'd laid people off at the merest downturn in trade, they'd been capricious, they'd uh, effectively been slave drivers and the only way that people on the coal field could see for the future development and security of the coal industry and their employment is for it to be taken into national ownership. And when you had someone of the reputation and standing of Lord Sankey objectively saying this should be the future of coal, there was a surge of hope, the blessing of the establishment, which was only to be smashed to smithereens by uh, the attitude taken by the government headed by Lloyd George. It clearly did damage his reputation enormously. Looking back now, do you think that was fair? Not really. Taken in a longer perspective, it's obvious. He did the right thing for the right reasons in introducing the welfare state. He did the wrong thing for what he thought were the right reasons in completely dismissing the recommendation of the Sankey Commission for the nationalization of the coal mining industry. Lloyd George was almost certainly oblivious to the effect that the Sankey affair was having on his reputation in parts of South Wales. He had what must have seemed to him like far more important matters to think about 
In 1922, he attended another major international peace conference, this time in the Italian city of Genoa. Many of the weaknesses of Versailles were discussed at the meeting, and some progress was made towards putting them right. But more striking, maybe, than what happened during the conference itself was what happened to Lloyd George and his family when they came home. When they got back to London, they received an amazing response. It was ample confirmation that after five years in office, Lloyd George was one of the most popular prime ministers ever seen. One person with vivid memories of that exceptional homecoming is Lloyd George's nephew, Dr. William George. He's now 92, and he was just nine years old when the event happened. The details are still fresh in his mind. I was with my mother and others awaiting his arrival in Victoria Station, and there was the red carpet out. And I remember getting into the car, the, the roles written, driven by Dyer, the chauffeur. And the streets on both sides were going up Whitehall. On both sides, there were cheering crowds. A cameraman was standing by in Downing Street to film Lloyd George and his family as they came back. He captured a touching moment of intimacy between the great man and his little nephew. I remember my uncle grabbing me and pulling me towards him, and I don't remember that. I mean, that obviously was an occasion that imprinted itself on my, on my memory. After the return from Genoa, Lloyd George's position seemed as secure as ever. But by the time these pictures were taken during a short holiday he took in North Wales in the autumn of 1922, his political career was, in fact, unravelling. Several factors lay behind the collapse. One was the increasing imperiousness of his leadership style. Another was the foul whiff of corruption that had clung about him for some months. In June 1922, the Gentlemen's Clubs of St. James's were abuzz with scandal. Lloyd George, it seems, was offering honours for cash, and not petty cash either. £10,000 for a knighthood, £50,000 for a seat in the House of Lords. The money was apparently destined for a political fighting fund to allow him to contest elections in future without having to rely on the Liberal Party, which was very important for him. But unfortunately for Lloyd George, very soon the honours scandal started to overshadow most of his achievements. I don't think actually the way he operated the honour system was any more corrupt than standard practice. It just was more exposed and he was pretty cynical about it because he had no particular regard for the House of Lords and didn't care who he put in it. People wish to buy these baubles, he's happy to sell them. He has as we know, contempt for the House of Lords and everyone wishes to clamber into that is an unworthy soul and therefore it surely follows if you can take them for a lot of money so much the better. The honour scandal didn't in fact have much of an effect on Lloyd George's popularity with the public and even many politicians weren't inclined to give it too much attention but his standing in Parliament was sinking fast all the same. There was a growing feeling, especially on the Conservative benches, that he'd grown too big for his boots. He'd have to go. A group of MPs started a whispering campaign against him, designed to topple him. And this seemed to gather momentum with every passing day. The pressure was intense, and it came to a head on the morning of October the 19th, 1922, in the grand surroundings of London's Carlton Club. There was a very big decision to be made. 273 Conservative MPs turned up at the club that morning to decide whether to go on supporting Lloyd George and his coalition government or to withdraw their support and bring that coalition crashing down. When the first MPs turned up for the meeting, no one knew whether or not the government was going to survive. But a damning speech by Lloyd George's main critic, Stanley Baldwin, settled the issue once and for all. The crisis meeting produced a very clear result. By two to one, the Conservative MPs decided to withdraw their support and bring Lloyd George's premiership 
to an abrupt end. Later that day, he and the family left Number 10 Downing Street, by all accounts, pretty cheerfully. Of course, they never imagined that his days in power were over for good. It has to be said that no one else realised this either. As he hit the campaign trail that December, mobbed by friendly crowds wherever he went, Lloyd George was widely seen as a man who was bound to be back in power before long. But that's not how things turned out. He kept his seat with ease at the election that followed, but both branches of the Liberal Party, the one led by him and the one led by Asquith, fared very badly at the polls. As the Liberals sank, the Labour Party rose. In January 1924, Ramsay MacDonald became the head of Britain's first ever Labour government. He fell from power again within 10 months, but another election brought no comfort to those who wished the Liberals well. Quite the opposite. What happened in the election of October 1924 is still a matter of controversy and debate even today because the once great Liberal Party was reduced to just 40 seats in Parliament. There hasn't been a Liberal government since those days. How on earth did that happen? Well, of course, the glib and the easy answer has been to blame it all on our friend David Lloyd George. Today, a rather more mature assessment tells us that there was a range of social and political factors which led to the strange death of liberal England. Lloyd George and his fellow liberals were being swept aside by an irresistible political tide. The age of liberalism was coming to an end. The age of socialism was about to dawn. Lloyd George refused to believe this and battled on. Asquith's decision to retire from politics in 1926 gave Lloyd George the chance he'd been looking for to lead a reunited Liberal Party. He set about trying to turn it once again into an election-winning force. Even his enemies inside the Liberal Party had to admit that Lloyd George had a vision and an energy that Asquith, frankly, lacked. One of them said that when Lloyd George came back into the party, ideas came back into the party. And here's part of the proof for you, one of a series of colour-coded policy documents masterminded by Lloyd George. This is the most famous one, it's called We Can Conquer Unemployment, which even for Lloyd George was quite a claim. Unemployment wasn't the problem it would be later on, but it was very high nonetheless, especially in places like Wales. All of Lloyd George's radical instincts were aroused by the crisis, and he committed himself to finding new ways of dealing with it. Displaying a remarkable ability to forgive and forget, he turned for help to John Maynard Keynes, the man who had poured scorn on his work at Versailles just a few years before. One of his great qualities was that on the whole he never bore grudges. You know, he tended just to move on with things, and he found Keynes, of course, very intelligent, which he was, and Keynes was developing his great theories of economics and was beginning to talk about how, in certain circumstances, government should be prepared to spend, even if it means running up deficits, which was completely counter to all the orthodoxy at the time. It, interesting enough, the, the policies were never actually implemented here, but they were very much the um, inspirer of Roosevelt's New Deal in the United States. So you could say that his, his, his legacy was not just affecting British politics, but American politics as well. The approach to unemployment favoured by Lloyd George and Keynes gave rise in America to huge public work schemes like the building of the Grand Coulee Dam. Many people, including Gordon Brown, believe that if such schemes had been tried in Britain, they might well have brought about a dramatic reduction in unemployment here, just as they had in the US. But Lloyd George, who'd worked so hard with Keynes, never got a chance to put those plans into effect. Much to his surprise, and that of many others, the election of 1929 delivered yet another rejection for the now elderly David Lloyd George. Yes, it's true the Liberal Party did increase its share of the vote, but not by very much. And very soon, the infighting had started all over again. By 1931, it was pretty clear that the Liberals were finished as a party of government, at least for the foreseeable future. 
and Lloyd George's great dream of curing British unemployment just faded away. By now, there was no way out of the wilderness, and the aging fighter knew it. But he never stopped fighting for the things he believed in, including international disarmament. We raised a gigantic sum of over 500 million. Every penny goes to pay to liquidate the cost of past wars and to pay a hundred millions to prepare for future wars. You will never disarm. You will never effect real disarmament until you renounce war not merely on a scroll of paper, but in the hearts of men. The old spark was still there, that was clear. But there was no disguising the fact that Lloyd George was getting old, and old men sometimes make mistakes. His mistake, when it came, was colossal. In 1936, he accepted an invitation from Adolf Hitler to visit him at Berchtesgaden, the dictator's alpine retreat. People are still dumbfounded by this remarkable lapse of judgment. The visit of Hitler was a catastrophe. Lloyd George genuinely felt, and many people uh, supported him, that the peacetime settlement, the settlement after 1918, was inherently unstable, that it needed fundamental revision, that there should be good relationships between Britain and Germany. This seems to be an honorable and proper outlook, except for the fact that Germany was led by Adolf Hitler and run by the National Socialists. And Lloyd George showed himself to many people strangely oblivious to the nature of Hitler's regime, its assaults on the Jews, its undermining of democracy and so on. It showed Lloyd George, I think, at his worst. There was an element of vanity in it. He was an old man and Hitler saying he was the greatest uh, politician of the age and asking for signed photographs and this kind of thing appealed to his vanity. I think he was wrong to go because of what, of course, what it did, among other things, was give Hitler a sort of respectability. Now, I've always heard from, from my mother that her grandmother, Lloyd George's wife, Margaret Lloyd George, refused to go with him. That she said, I'm not going to see that man. I think you're very wrong to go, and I will not come with you. And in these circumstances, Lloyd George decided to make a partial withdrawal from public life. He still attended the House of Commons and continued to make powerful speeches from time to time, but he also spent much more time than he had in the past in the company of family and friends. In 1943, two years after Margaret Lloyd George had died, he married Frances Stevenson, bringing into the open for the first time a relationship that had flourished in secret for 30 years. A long marriage wasn't something either of them could reasonably expect, given the groom's age, and in the end, they had just two years as man and wife. After discovering that Lloyd George was suffering from cancer in 1944, they moved to Llanastimdwy, the village in which Lloyd George had grown up and which had always been dear to his heart. And it was there, on March the 26th, 1945, that the great Welshman died at the age of 82. His funeral in Llanus Dimdwy was followed by a memorial service in London, attended by the most powerful people in the land. There seemed every reason to suppose that day that he would be remembered just as long and with just as much affection as his friend Winston Churchill would be. But that wasn't how things turned out. When Churchill died in 1966, the magnificent state funeral reflected the huge respect in which he was held. Lloyd George, in stark contrast, had already become someone the British people had started to forget. Why had his reputation faded so much in such a short space of time? Partly, it's thought, because of wildly differing attitudes to the First and Second World Wars.
The two wars were seen in very different lights. The First World War very negatively, Second World War as being a, you know, a heroic moment of the, the, the Britain's finest, finest hour. Uh, and in a sense, the reputations of Lloyd George and Churchill were tied to the reputations of those two wars. Churchill was the man who won the Second World War. The Second World War was a good thing to have won it, was therefore a heroic thing to have done. To be the man who won the First World War associates him with Passchendaele and the Somme and all the rest of it. Well, some of us aren't so sure that the horrors of the First World War are the main reason for Lloyd George's damaged reputation. Let's be clear. All the talk about womanizing and corruption has been just as unhelpful. But what's important now is that the decline in his reputation is reversed. Not even Lloyd George's greatest fans, and I'm one of them, would claim that he was a saint. Far from it. He made some very, very serious mistakes. Visiting Hitler in 1936 was not his finest hour. Selling honours in 1922 was a bit of sleaze best avoided. And clinging on to power in 1918 turned out to be very unwise indeed. But are we really saying that these mistakes devalue his real achievement in transforming British society? I don't think so. David Lloyd George made this country a much more democratic place by giving working class people the right to vote and by breaking the power of the House of Lords. More than that, he kept the country going during the darkest days of the First World War. And surely, he deserves our everlasting thanks for transforming the lives of the sick, the elderly and the unemployed by laying the foundations of the welfare state. For far too long, the British people have forgotten the immense debt that they owe to David Lloyd George. He was a force for good. Let's say so proudly and clearly, a true champion of the people. And the time has come, surely, for us all to give the fullest recognition to this genius of a man. for a change to the schedule next on BBC4 as we continue with our look at the life and times of Lloyd George in Peacemakers. of considerable learning, Richard Lloyd. Although he'd spent his life making shoes, he read considerably, he had a, a very nimble mind, he was very politically involved uh, and very theologically involved. So it was, in a sense, an ideal upbringing. What Richard Lloyd tried to do, and did very successfully, was pass on to young David the values that governed his own life, seriousness, diligence, and a thirst for knowledge. Thanks to his uncle's example and the extensive library left to him by his dead father, David Lloyd George, as he now started calling himself in his uncle's honour, developed into a mature and thoughtful child with firm political views. <laughs> 
Well, I think right from the beginning, he cared passionately about social justice. I mean, he grew up in the North Wales where there were very clear class distinctions and also, I think, quite clear ethnic distinctions. There was an Anglo-Welsh upper class, and they owned a great deal of the land in those days, and I think Lord George was very conscious of that, as, as many Welsh people were. The divisions that ran right through Wales during Lloyd George's childhood were very deep indeed, and they were just as evident in Llanis Dimdwy as they were elsewhere. Most of the people who lived in the village were relatively poor, but a small minority, the landed gentry of the area, were prosperous individuals who differed from the ordinary villagers in many important ways. For a start, they spoke English instead of Welsh. They were also Anglicans, members of the Church of England, who trooped along every Sunday to Llanis Dimdwy's parish church, whereas the other villagers were all chapel-goers, or non-conformists, as we should really call them. The non-conformist majority felt, with some justification, that they were oppressed by the Anglican elite. And the social tension this created in the village had a big effect on Lloyd George. We know this because of a key episode in his early life. It took place at Llanis Dimdwy's tiny village school, when Lloyd George was a pupil here, around the year 1873. He was just ten years old at the time, but the incident proves he had a much greater sense of social justice than we'd normally expect of a child. Just like today, most of the children who attended the school back then were Welsh speakers. Unlike today, for the most part, they were devout non-conformists too. And yet, because the school was run by the Church of England, lessons were conducted in English, and the Anglican faith was the order of the day. The situation was hardly acceptable, and Lloyd George became determined to do something. What he did was dramatised later on in a fascinating silent movie, which is held today at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. I've always wanted to see the film, so this is my chance. Hall Museum dedicated to his memory, which stands today in his home village of Llanis Dimdwy. As the many drawings confirm, even Britain's cartoonists, then as now a pretty unsentimental bunch, tended to portray him in a warm and sympathetic light. Genuine respect for his achievements across a wide range of fields clearly had a lot to do with this. But the nature of his personality was pretty important too. Ask anyone who met him and they'll confirm straight away that here was a man whose personality was captivating and utterly hypnotic. I met him in 1937 when my dad was re-elected to the House of Commons and uh, it's, it's very vividly fixed in my mind, this short, magnetic man. I mean, talk about charisma, the man absolutely radiated it. Lloyd George could charm a crowd like no other. That's clear from the piece of film you're about to see, which was shot at a gala evening held to celebrate his golden wedding anniversary in 1938. Marriage is um, one of the very few institutions that enable people whose dispositions and temperaments are exactly opposite to each other to live in perfect harmony <laughs> for fully 50 years. And it hardly say, my wife and I have different temperaments. <laughs> One of us contentious. <laughs> Combative. Stormy. That's my wife. <laughs> then there's the other partner. Classy, <laughs> calm, feasible, and patient. <laughs> That's me. Great warmth and natural wit added enormously to Lloyd George's appeal. They played a big part in making him such a popular figure. But not everyone fell under his spell. <laughs> 
Far from it. Lloyd George had a big problem, which was that Britain's political elite had never known anyone like him. They didn't understand him, so they didn't trust him. He was considered a very dangerous demagogue. The fact that he was Welsh made it worse. Somebody put together a whole series of libelous comments on the Welsh called Perfidious Welshman in 1911. And that is, and it sold remarkably well. And the sole motivation of that was to get at Lloyd George, there could be no doubt about it. And he was so identified with Wales that he was not part of the metropolitan establishment. And I suppose that um, Toffee knows London rather looked down on this sort of Celtic country bumpkin. A certain degree of anti-Welsh prejudice has always been acceptable and not something to be ashamed of. I mean, you know, Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief, and people would say this perfectly easily. So he had to overcome, and did overcome, a great deal of that sort of social prejudice simply by, A, ability, because he was just simply very clever and very able, but also by being very likable and infectious. No one was more dismissive of David Lloyd George during his lifetime than the Cambridge economist John Maynard Keynes. And in a very famous essay in 1920, he wrote this about Lloyd George. He said that he was a goat-footed bard, a half-human visitor from the hag-ridden magic and enchanted woods of Celtic antiquity. And for good measure, he said that Lloyd George was rooted in nothing. Well, with respect to Keynes, Lloyd George was very firmly rooted in a particular time and place and culture. Rural North Wales in the second half of the 19th century. The man called the Welsh wizard was actually born on the outskirts of Manchester in 1863, but his parents brought him back to their native Wales when he was just six months old. Not long afterwards, his father, a schoolteacher called William George, died suddenly at the age of 43, leaving his young widow, Elizabeth, with two small children and another on the way. Lacking the money she needed to raise the family as a single mother, Elizabeth had no choice but to move back to the house where she'd grown up, in the tiny village of Llanas Dimdwy. The house was called Highgate, and it still stands today. It's been carefully restored in recent years by the local council, and now looks pretty much the way it did during Lloyd George's childhood. Anyone who's interested in Lloyd George would be well advised to come here. Seeing the very modest surroundings in which he grew up gives you a strong sense of who he was and what his early life must have been like. Lloyd George, the great statesman, once proudly described himself as a cottage-bred man. And he wasn't joking. Back in those days, prime ministers of Great Britain were not expected to emerge from little places like this. Just two bedrooms, this is the bigger of the two, and if you can believe it, there were five people sleeping here, as we understand it. Lloyd George and his brother and sister, and their mother, and then her mother too. No Lou, that's at the bottom of the garden, what we call in Welsh a tea bach, or a little house. And the other bedroom is through here. Take a look at it. It's much smaller than the other one. And this was the room of Richard Lloyd, David's uncle, the man who had more influence on Lloyd George than anyone else. Richard Lloyd, Uncle Lloyd, as David and his siblings called him, was a trained shoemaker and the family's only breadwinner. But that's not all he was by any means. He was as a social reformer. Here we have the first British politician to go from very humble origins to number 10 Downing Street. He never forgot what it was to be poor. And he had a burning desire to improve the lives of working class people. And over a long and extraordinary career, that is what he did. People talk about Churchill as being a great Prime Minister, and indeed he was. But Lord George had an amazing ministerial and Prime Ministerial record, leaving behind major social change, and that's something that Churchill didn't have. <laughs> 
to be able to create something from, from nothing, which is what was happening in the 1906 to 1914 uh, liberal, liberal government, uh, what, what was a tremendous success, and it, 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 it will not surpass by anybody. I think he was an incredibly creative force. Oh, yes, of course, pensions, uh, national insurance, health insurance, which is a tremendous advance, far ahead of what the Americans have done even today. And uh, really, to look at LG in that period, he would be so far to the left of New Labour that he would have been immediately expelled by Blair. Let them realize what they're doing. They are forcing a revolution, and they will get it. He said in one of his diaries that it was a worthy aim to promote yourself by benefiting others. And I think that is what drove him on. He was the people's champion. many people these days fail to realize is that David Lloyd George was once one of the most famous men alive. When he visited America in 1923, thousands of people turned out to see him. They did so because, like millions of people around the world, they saw him as the chief architect of Britain and America's victory over Germany in the First World War. He was mobbed, not just in New York City, but everywhere he went. Whether he was making a brief stop on the vast prairies of Canada, or appearing in St. Louis as guest of honor at a gathering of Native American chiefs. Yes, he was big abroad, but believe me, he was much, much bigger at home. This small man was a political giant. Lloyd George wasn't just respected in Britain, he was widely loved. That's something you can't fail to pick up when you visit the small... Now on BBC4, Hugh Edwards pays tribute to Britain's first working-class Prime Minister, Lloyd George, the people's champion. the River Duivor near Krukiev in North Wales. It's a stretch of water that meant a lot to a man who means a lot to me, David Lloyd George. These days, many people in Britain barely recognize his name. But it was a very different story some 60 years ago. Lloyd George died in March 1945, in the closing months of the Second World War. He was an old man by the time of his death, so it came as no surprise. And yet his funeral was marked by an astonishing expression of grief. People came from all over Britain to pay their last respects to a man who dominated the political scene for much of their lives, and whose place in history they believed was assured. Like Winston Churchill, with whom he'd enjoyed a long political partnership, Lloyd George was rightly regarded as one of the greatest prime ministers in British history. On the day of his funeral, the tributes came from every part of the globe. What on earth would the mourners who gathered on that day have made of the fact that by today, their national hero would enjoy a less than impressive reputation? This is the utterly magical spot where over 60 years ago, David Lloyd George was laid to rest under this simple stone on the steep banks of the River Duivor in North Wales. 
one of the most brilliant statesmen of the 20th century and one of the greatest Welshmen of all time. And yet, if you mention his name today, even in parts of Wales, you risk getting an unpleasant response. Because the Welsh wizard, with the colourful private life, has been reduced in the eyes of many people to the level of a smutty joke. And I have to say to you that I find that a grotesque injustice. David Lloyd George was hardly a saint. Let's make that plain from the start. Yes, he was a womanizer, and yes, he had other failings too. He made some dreadful mistakes during his long career. The biggest of all, perhaps, his inexplicable decision to spend time with Adolf Hitler in the run-up to the Second World War. But errors like this, great as they are, can't detract from just how much he achieved. Most of us were taught at school about Lloyd George's remarkable record as a Prime Minister in wartime. What is less familiar, perhaps, is his unmatched achievement.